Well, thanks very much, John, uh, for the invitation. I'm, I'm glad to be here. I've been uh, a real fan of Hugh Ross and his ministry for many, many years. I've got a long section on my bookshelf <laughs> full of uh, Hugh Ross books, which I refer to quite frequently. Uh, uh, I've had the opportunity to come to know Hugh personally, uh, in particular uh, in uh, various times. When he's been to UT, uh, as part of that, I've scheduled personal times to sit down and fellowship, and so we've uh, uh, had a mutually stimulating and I would say respectful interactions on numerous occasions. So uh, I'll be teach, uh, talking today about this course that I teach. It's called Science in the Bible. It is in the UT curriculum. Students take it for graduation credit. It is part of what is called the Signature Course Series. Uh, uh, one of our previous Presidents, Bill Powers had a very successful money raising campaign. He uh, obtained over $3 billion. And a significant chunk of that was used to <clears throat> establish a new college, a College of Undergraduate Studies, and a series of courses to help integrate new students into this huge university. Uh, we get about 11,000 new students coming in every year. And uh, uh, as with uh, very large universities, of, they're all over the United States these days, it's easy to come in and get lost. And the consideration was that we want each student coming in to be in a small group interaction with uh, 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 an experienced professor, and obviously I'm experienced. Uh, this is year number 49 for me on the faculty. In fact, this week I just told my chair I'm gonna retire at the end of next year when my clicker goes to 50. I'll go into phased retirement. And so uh, uh, those funds that were raised are used to uh, essentially buy the teaching time out of normal teaching obligations for experienced faculty to teach courses that would be uh, particular to new students, uh, not so advanced that a graduating high school senior cannot come in, but to be intellectually stimulating, uh, to give them uh, mentoring and developing their critical thinking uh, skills. And so uh, most of these courses are taught by people on the opposite side of campus from where I work, uh, liberal arts and fine arts. Uh, very few are taught by uh, engineers and scientists and, and really I never uh, considered teaching one myself uh, I think the program's been in place for about 12 years or so. But uh, I am a Christian. I have been a very serious believer since the uh, first year of my graduate studies, which dates back, uh, it'll be 55 years this year. I was a graduate student at MIT, freshly married. and. Uh, uh, my wife and I had determined that we wanted to have uh, a life centered around our Christian faith. It turns out I'd never received the Lord. I was a religious churchgoer. Uh, my wife may have been, but she was pretty much in the same category. And uh, one Sunday we went to this very big impressive place in Boston. They had a uh, gospel weekend. And there was an altar call, which I'd never seen before, and uh, my wife was in the choir. I was in the back with the ushers, and at the end of the altar call, we met together up at the altar and made a very serious commitment to follow the Lord uh, in, our, in our married life, and that obviously was many years ago. So this uh, 
caused me some internal concern, though, because uh, the common concept was, look, if I'm going to be a serious Christian, and I was a serious graduate student at the best engineering school in the world, MIT, uh, automatically I had a conflict, and a lot of my peers absolutely had that attitude. And so I began wrestling with this apparent inward conflict. How can I really be a person who is serious about my faith and at the same time pursue the career uh, through the door? Uh, the very de desirably advantageous door that is open to me. And, and so to this very time, I have been considering this issue. And I've received a lot of light, both on the science side and on the Bible side. Well, eventually I graduated, did a postdoc, and UT hired me 49 years ago, 1973. And uh, Students, not because I broadcast my faith, but they learn to know, hey, this Professor Diller is a serious Christian. And so in appropriate informal settings, they would ask me, how do you reconcile the spiritual side of your existence with the professional side? of your existence, and students were genuinely very interested in this, and so I began to talk with them individually in small groups, and then student organizations began to invite me, and the word got out, and I, I had given talks coast to coast in university campuses on this topic, and how I have resolved what I consider to be a rock-solid faith and an absolute commitment to my scientific pursuits. Uh, and so uh, I was given a talk at UT nine years ago at the beginning of the fall semester on this topic. And there were some freshmen in the audience, and I made the offhanded remark, uh, I'm glad to be talking to you about this topic, but I wish I had more than just this little piece of time. I've got enough information I could teach a whole course on this. And so these freshmen came up to me, and at the time I was, I, I'd been a department chair for nearly 20 years, okay? First in mechanical engineering, and I was the founding chair of biomedical engineering. So uh, I, I was a, a very senior professor at UT, and these bold little freshmen came up to me and said, we challenge you. You said you could teach a course, and UT has special courses for freshmen in the signature series. You need to put together a, a course in this area. And so uh, I said, okay, I will consider your challenge seriously. So that night, I went home, I got on my computer, I uh, looked up the signature courses, and at that time, there was a different dean of undergraduate studies. And there were a number of courses that were offered to our incoming freshmen that uh, um, provoked me in my spirit absolutely against the principles of Christian living. I won't even mention them, but uh, they were defiling. And, and I think you can imagine what they were like. We, ha we have a different dean now. Those courses have been purged. In fact, every course has to be renewed on an annual basis. They, uh, the dean and his staff, they review very carefully and thoroughly, the course instructor surveys, uh, the content of the courses, and uh, it's, it's uh, a model program around the United States. Uh, our dean gives lectures all over the country, other schools wanting to have similar programs to integrate new students. So as I began to read some of the, what seemed to me, trash that uh, 
incoming students were exposed to, I was uh, provoked in my spirit. I said, if students can get that, they should be able to have a course in this. Truly, truly so. And so that night, uh, I had a flow in my spirit, and I sat down and I designed that course from A to B, the entire syllabus and, and everything. And I submitted it to my department chair. I, I fellowshiped with some other believers that I'm quite close to. Green light. Uh, by that point in time, I had finished my tenure as department chair, and so I had to go through my existing department chair, who was a, a practicing Greek Orthodox Christian. He was very enthusiastic, supportive. Uh, had to go to the Dean of Engineering, support. Had to go to the Dean of Undergraduate Studies, approval. And so for the last eight years, I have been teaching this course, and uh, my burden is that students would encounter the truth. In fact, let me show you where my classroom is. Yeah, so you may recognize that building if you go out the door and up the hill. This is what you encounter. And so we meet in there. And on the first day of class, you know, we, we meet on this floor right here. And so we go down the Grand Circus and come out here onto the plaza. And I tell the students, turn around, look up, and tell me what you see. And I think a lot of you know what you see. Uh, that says, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, students, where do you think that comes from? <laughs> some head scratching, and some, some say, uh, I think maybe it's from the Bible. It's on the front of the uh, iconic building at the University of Texas. And I said, well, you're right. And uh, where from in the Bible? Well, New Testament. Occasionally, I get somebody who just pounces. That's John 8, 32. You're right. And it's one thing to know it, but uh, one, one of my burdens is that uh, I, in Texas, I get lots and lots of lovers of the Lord Jesus coming into my class. They've grown up pursuing Christian life, Christian living, since they were little kids and healthy families. Uh, but a lot of them are very confused concerning the topic. My course, they've heard all kinds of things. And my desire is they to be strengthened in their faith spiritual faith, and that they have confidence in science also. And many have been taught you got to be in one side of the fence or the other side of the fence. And uh, they're conflicted. Uh, <clears throat> I also get uh, a lot of students who claim initially to be either agnostic or atheist. And uh, when we explore what's going on with them in class, uh, many of them are that way because they put, put in, backed into a court. You have to choose faith or choose science, one or the other, and they're not willing to give up science, which, which I agree with. I mean, science is wonderful. You shouldn't give it up. And so they throw out the issue of faith. Many of them have been turned off by dogmatic religion. And so they throw out the baby with the bath water. And so uh, I, I tell the students, this verse on the front of the tower is going to be our theme 
for this entire semester. We read the Bible in class every day. We talk about science, various things of science, and I'm a very, very active scientist to this day. I, I just had a, an important new patent uh, approved yesterday, and so exciting things are still going on. Biomedical engineer, I hope that patent will open the door to uh, improved health for millions and millions of people. A a anyway, so obviously I'm enthusiastic about science as well as my faith. So uh, at the end of the semester, the students have to write about their experience in the course and nearly all of them. Christians say, my faith was strengthened, issues that I had real concerns about have been resolved. I wish my mom and dad could sit in this course with me. <laughs> and actually, I wish they could also. Some of those who claim, well, I would say virtually all, who claim to be agnostic or atheist admit that the basis for that claim that they had at the beginning of the course has evaporated. And they realize now it has come down to a personal choice. Do I want to accept Christ as my life or do I not? And that's a personal choice. Some say, uh, I'm not ready to make that choice, but when I am, I know exactly what to do. Okay. And some make a declaration of faith during the course, which I find to be absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Uh, let me ask John, what is my timeline here? I guess we'll sit here until till we're bored. So <laughs> talk as long as you can. Uh, I, I'm reluctant to talk as long as I can. <laughs> <laughs> what? 11.30. Okay, yes. Yeah, so I need to pace myself here. Uh, so that, that is somewhat the context of how this course occurs. I, I, I must say, to add a little bit to that context, I have been absolutely amazed at how accepting the students, my faculty colleagues, and the university administration has been to having a course like this, where I speak as freely and directly as I'm led in class about the Christian experience. And uh, um, I very much have the burden that these students could realize that being a Christian is more than just an intellectual exercise. It is a personal experience, or it can be, and that is my desire for them. And uh, we talk a lot about the experiential side of being a Christian uh, beyond just uh, the theological or the apologetic side. You know, the apologetic side absolutely backs up our experience. And the apologetic side, from my view, is made rich by being confirmed in our experience. Now, I try to make it clear whenever I give a talk like this, that in going through the available information, deciding what the truth is in the science side, deciding what the truth is in the biblical side, oftentimes encounter people who have not resolved this issue the same way I have. And so uh, I, I wanna make it very explicitly clear regarding what we believe and actually I carry my own statement of common faith, which I go through with the students. This, <clears throat> so let me talk about this a little bit. Uh, you can't see this now. I'm going to turn my doc camera on. Anybody who wants to see my statement of common faith, I'm, I'm glad to share it, but it's, it's pretty typical. 
It's just some basic things that are expected that you would agree with if you are genuinely a Christian. You believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, okay? Uh, the God is uniquely one, but he is three, Father, Son, and Spirit. And uh, God the Son became incarnated, the man Jesus. He died on the cross for our sins, shedding his blood for our redemption. He resurrected from the dead on the third day. He ascended to the right hand of God to be Lord of all, that he could impart his life into us as 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says, as the life-giving spirit. He's coming again to receive his believers to himself. And when a person repents to God and believes in the Lord Jesus, he is regenerated. He's born again. He receives God's life into him. And as far as I'm concerned, that's all you need to be considered my fellow brother or sister in the Lord Jesus. Now, your statement of faith, uh, essentially I agree with everything it says, but this is not something I would enforce on other people, and I encounter people who don't agree with it, and that should not be at all surprising to you all. Uh, I encounter a lot of young earth creationists. I've got good friends who have that viewpoint, good Christian friends. And if you want to believe that before the Lord, that's absolutely up to you, but I'm not going to sign up for your <laughs> uh, uh, way, way to go. Okay. Uh, so every person has to resolve for themselves before the Lord how this all fits together for them. And, and as I said, I have been a strong sympathizer for RTB for decades. And uh, I consider Hugh Ross a friend, and I'm glad to be here today. Now, uh, let me start with painting the big picture of how I have gone about resolving this issue about the interface between science and the Bible. And then I'll have some time at the end for details, and the details are numerous. Uh, there are some very standard details that people want to get into. Uh, I, I can bring up some of them. I'll be glad to answer any questions that you want to ask. Uh, So let me say one more thing about the class, and that is I, I set up the, uh, the syllabus for the course so this, uh, I, I give the students a challenging topic every week. And I want to address head on the issues of greatest controversy on this topic, and so we spent a lot of time talking about origins. Origins of the physical universe, origins of life, I'm a biomedical engineer, origins of the human species, okay? These are some of the most controversial issues. I spent a lot of time talking about evolution, uh, the science of evolution, and boy, there is a whole spectrum uh, particularly in the religious side of viewpoints about evolution. And it's one of the most conflicting uh, topics for believers who do not want to forego their allegiance to science. So we just get straight into that topic and in an honest way, truthful way in the science side, truthful way on the... Uh, spiritual or biblical side. And so, uh, some time back, uh, I tried to organize my thoughts 
in a simplistic way. I'm an engineer, and so I like to draw diagrams or make a picture. And, and so I put together this diagram, which I call Understanding Creation. And uh, some of this I've derived from other very thoughtful people, including you. Uh, and some of this has come to me personally. And so I'll just throw it out here. You don't have to jump on board with me or not, but in a very honest way, this is what my thoughts are. And so, uh, when, in, interestingly, people ask me to talk about creation. Usually, they mean what the Bible calls the old creation, you know, the physical realm that we live in. But the Bible also talks about the reality of there being a new creation, particularly in the New Testament times after the Lord came, he was incarnated, he lived, he was crucified, and he resurrected and ascended. And that gave rise to the new creation. And so uh, I like to talk about both. Uh, now, relating to the material creation, the realm in which we live, uh, there's two different perspectives. You can view uh, the material creation from the viewpoint of science or from the viewpoint of the Bible. And as far as I can see, those are both value, valid. And, and in fact, if you take the truth on both sides, what you come to is a realization that there is a harmony or a compatibility between these two views. And so science talks about processes. And we use math to describe those processes, how things change under the action of forces, internal and external. And uh, if you take science courses, uh, yeah, this is what you uh, learn. Contrastingly, the Bible talks about the creation in terms of its purpose. Science does not tell us what the purpose of the creation is. It tells us its functionality, it gives us a way to describe it, to understand it, to use that understanding to uh, design things, to make the materials of the old creation more useful. Somebody designed this building, and here we sit with full confidence it's not going to fall down on us. That's because some engineers and architects designed this using the tools of science, but it doesn't tell us what the purpose is in designing it. The Bible gives us purpose, which is very meaningful. Man, humans are very interested in these processes, but inwardly there's a desire to know what is going on. Okay. <clears throat> The methods of science require a proof. Uh, you start learning about proofs when you take high school math. I have memories going clear back, unpleasant memories, <laughs> of learning to do proofs. And uh, whatever you do in science, you have to be able to prove it, to back it up, and you publish it, and then other people need to take what you have reported and supposedly proved and be able to prove it independently themselves. And so if you can't prove it in science, it's not believable uh, and uh, chances are it's not real. Contrastingly, in the spiritual realm, rather than proof, we live by faith. Okay? <clears throat> faith is in many ways in contrast to proof. I love Hebrews chapter 11, you know, the chapter on faith, starting with Abraham, the father of faith. Okay, in science, you have to be able to measure things, 
these are sometimes called observables. Big part of science, what we do is we develop sensors, transducers, that we can measure the state, what's going on. Uh, if you can't make the measurement, then you don't have any basis for doing your proof. On the spiritual side, I really like 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Does anybody off the top know what that verse says? We live by faith, not by uh, various translations, sight, observation, and so forth. So our Christian faith is not based on the outwardly observable. <clears throat> The reality is inward. There is no such thing as a spiritual transducer. You can't put some transducer on me, hook it up to your uh, DAC, input it into the computer and record what's going on in my spirit. That does not work. You, you can record what's going on in my body. You can even record what's going on uh, uh, emotionally in yeah, my person, personality, but not, not spiritually. And so science tells us how things happen, and the Bible tells us why things happen. Both of these sides in their own domain, from my viewpoint, are absolutely valid. They do not cross out each other. Okay? The validity of science does not negate the Bible. Likewise, the validity of spiritual reality does not negate what's going on in science. They can exist together. Actually, neither one individually has the whole picture. But the picture each one has is valid. And if you bring them together, they do what you can call interdigitating. And you get a more complete understanding of what is going on. There is a purpose. In addition, to all the physical realm that we live in. And so it's very possible to accept these together, and together, to me, they make nice music. <laughs> okay, they are harmonious together. They're absolutely compatible. Now, the thing about the old creation is uh, that it is what we as scientists call isolated from the creator. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I love the science called thermodynamics. You know, my colleague Dennis is in back here. Same, how long were you in that department, Dennis? 21 years, yeah. So you know the, the laws, same with Sarah, so forth. And uh, those are called the so-called conservation principles. Uh, <clears throat> energy, momentum, and mass. And it, it says that everything is conserved. Yeah, the, the mass of the universe is not being changed uh, other than uh, uh, equals mc squared kinds of stuff. But macroscopically, uh, we depend on this. This provides an environmental stab stability for us to live in without concern about being turned upside down. This is because the old creation is basically 
isolated from the creator in, in, in the physical sense. Now, this doesn't talk about miracles, and students always say, Professor, what about miracles? Well, I can talk about that if you want to. <clears throat> and so uh, we depend on that to do science. But there is the new creation, which is in an entirely different realm. The old creation is in the material realm. The new creation is in the spiritual realm. <clears throat> the new creation came into existence when Christ began to impart his life into human beings who opened up themselves to receive him. And so this is how God's purpose is fulfilled. And there is a process by which this occurs. And let me parenthetically say, when we read the Bible every day in class, uh, from the beginning, from the very first day, I try and make it clear to the students, the Bible is loaded, loaded with detailed information. But there is a big picture that everything should fit into. And uh, I, I have uh, decided to try and simplify this. I, I consider that one of my jobs as a professor to take complicated stuff, make it as simple as possible to me and then hopefully to the students likewise. And so when you, from my view, when you read the Bible, you can look for three P's. The Bible can tell us about God's person. The Bible, and it does, I should not have said can, it does tell us about God's person. Secondly, it tells us about God's purpose. It answers the why question. And the third P is what God's plan is from before the Big Bang through eternity future, how his purpose will be fulfilled. He has a plan. That plan is revealed in the Bible. It came into actuality, and it can be wrapped up in what's called God's economy, Greek word oikonomeia. And basically, his economy describes how he, in an initial way, dispenses his life into people, but then uh, a huge focus is on day-to-day -day experience through the rest of your life after you receive Christ as your Savior. Uh, he is adding, as you are open, continually to you. Uh, this is the very best economics. It's not probably taught in economics here. In fact, uh, my simple-minded, from the other side of campus view of economics is there are different economic plans for how to distributed, distribute limited resources to a defined population of people that according to whatever the model is, is in the most fair way. And we all know there's lots of different economic models that are followed. But uh, the basic principle is to recognize there are limited resources. Everybody cannot have as much as they want, okay? That is not the way things work in the realm of God's economy. The capital in God's economy is his very life. And after our spirit is regenerated, his life comes into us, then day by day, experience by experience, he can add more and more to his life. This is what we call growing as a Christian or maturing or however you want to determine it. And through the rest of our days, as long as we are living active on earth, we can be continually receiving more and more of God's life 
individually and in fellowship also. That's a big part of it. So we have God's economy and there are lots of verses in the New Testament to back this up. Paul's writings are magnificent, okay? And so, for instance, he talks about there being a bountiful supply. The only limitation is how much we avail ourselves of it, okay? So this is my big picture. I speak at the University of Texas with my students as openly as I have right now. And in my eight years, nobody has come after me. <laughs> in fact, uh, I, 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 I just am fulfilled and the students enjoy it. And my faculty colleagues respect this. Uh, some agree with me, some don't agree with me. But even those who don't agree with me, they I, I get feedback all the time. This is wonderful that there can be such an environment for deep consideration for our students. I pray over this course a lot. I try to pray for my students before class each day. This course started out in the small format. <clears throat> 18 student enrollment and the uh, desire to get into this class was overwhelming. I kept getting emails, Professor, your class is full, I can't enroll in it. So I made an appeal to expand it to, by a factor of three, so I have more than 50 students now. Same thing, it fills up to the max. And uh, my engineering students even come and they, they say, we understand you teach this course, we wish we could take it. And I think I'll start teaching a non-credit course where students can come and we'll talk just like we are right now. Because this is the truth and the truth can set us free. And that should be what happens at the University of Texas. Now, I've talked about the big picture within five minutes of my stop time. Some of the details. Uh, I would be glad to entertain questions, for example, about uh, the origin of man. Uh, I like to share with the students what I consider to be the, three, the, the four great miracles of the Bible. The Bible is just chock full of miracles, which, from my view, have their impact in a local manner in time and space. But there are four miracles that are not, a miracle something happens, it's not, can't be described scientifically. Okay, four great miracles, absolutely key to God fulfilling his plan that are, that science is bereft of a way of describing them. One is the appearance of human beings very quickly on earth. Uh, <coughs> And I won't get into evolution. I, I believe in evolution. Uh, but evolution does not give us a way to paint the full picture. There has to be some divine intervention. There is a gap. Scientists who are honest acknowledge the fact that evolution cannot give the full explanation of how we came into existence when we did with all of our capabilities that are in God's image after his likeness and with a spirit. Okay, so uh, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26, 28, plus chapter 2, verse 7. Okay, so the triune God put on earth a tripartite man. 
with a body, a soul, and a spirit. And th three separate Greek words for life, bios, suke, and zoe, okay? And the spiritual part matches God as a spirit, and that's how we receive him, that's how we communicate with God, okay? So that was a miracle. It's not explained scientifically. Number two, where did human language come from? I find it interesting you're having a topic that you're going to talk about, right, John? The alphabet and so forth. But if you go back even from there, how did man come to have language? We know that only humans have the creative, intellectually powerful use of language. And we know also that every human has to be taught a language. And so if you just ratchet back, back, I, I really enjoy the writings of Arthur Custance. I don't know if any of you have come across him or not. I've got a set of 10 books that he wrote. And one of the questions he asked is, who taught Adam to speak? In other words, where did human language come from? Consider how critical is human language for God to achieve his purpose. We have this book. This is primarily how we know God. It's been translated into thousands of languages, either in part or completely. The way that we communicate with God is by prayer. The way we communicate with each other is by fellowship, by ministry. The way we receive God's life, Romans Chapter 10 is by calling on him. Yeah, we need to initiate an interaction with God. And the way we do that is with language, whatever language you're using. And it goes on and on and on. So how did man get equipped with language, which is really essential for God to be able to achieve his purpose? And so I was reading Genesis 2. And we had all this problem getting my doc cam set up so I could share my Bible with you. <laughs> We're not going to do that. But I was reading Genesis 2, and I saw God having a conversation with man, giving man the instructions, Adam, for how to live his life. And it's oriented towards which tree you partake of, the tree of life or the tree of knowledge, of good and evil. And so God gave man the instructions. And you follow right through in the Bible till you get to the end, and you're right there, tree of life, New Jerusalem. And so that's the principle that God has for man in his living. So God gave man those instructions. What is the very next thing that happens? Realize this is biblical, not scientific, and you have to be careful about mapping between science and the Bible. Lots and lots and lots of people have wandered off into the deep weeds trying to map from one side to the other. Okay, <clears throat> but God gave man the instructions for how to live, and the next thing was that he brought all the animals to man to give him a name. How did Adam have that capability? Well, just like all humans, he has to be taught to use language. Now, I'm not saying the Bible describes the process for human language acquisition, but uh, linguists are unable to describe the source of language, other than to say there was a proto-language. Well, who knows what that was? So God, from me, by a divine method, made an intervention to enable man to have a language which is absolutely critical 
for his purpose to be fulfilled. Okay, third and fourth miracles are very well known. The incarnation, not scientifically described. The resurrection, not scientifically described. Both, absolutely critical. Once those four things are taken care of, God's purpose can unfold. And we have the ability, the responsibility, the privilege of partaking in it. Well, I've gone three minutes past my deadline. I'm going to stop. But it, it, I don't know if you do Q&A, but I'll, I'll be glad to respond to absolutely anything you want to ask about. I have a setup question and then the question. So the setup question is, there is a perception that universities and most professors are very liberal. That, would you agree that that is accurate or is it a false perception? And again, most, not, not at all. Yeah, so uh, you have to be careful about generalizing too broadly. Uh, <clears throat> if, you, uh, if I were testifying in court and I was required to give a one-word answer, that would be yes. Okay, okay so that's the setup question. So the follow-up question, Ed, I think I lost the volume here. So the follow-up to that, and it also seems to be pervasive in the media as well. And so my, my question is, what is it about those two that seems to draw people, liberal people, the liberal persuasion, if you will? And so someone who's an educator inside the institution, it's just my own personal curiosity, what is it about the system itself that seems to draw that ideology, if you will? Well, the only way I can respond <clears throat> is with my personal opinion, which goes no further than that. But academia is populated with people who have been high achievers in the intellectual realm. And that doesn't mean that in other realms of their human existence, they're uh, high achievers, you know, emotional intelligence and, and so forth. Uh, and, and so many academics, and I've sat in the faculty council for years, I've been a department chair equivalent for nearly 20, uh, a, a lot of, Faculty members, you know, they're very accomplished, and there's ways that that's measured, and people tend to be very proud of that. Uh, a lot of their personal identity is wrapped up with their perception of how other people perceive them. And they want to be acknowledged as being independent, thicker, thinkers, and being a Christian uh, inherently means that we are dependent on God's life and we follow God's life. And, and so I, I am pleased to say I am a servant of my Lord Jesus. Uh, I follow his lead and that is uh, an acknowledgement that a lot of colleagues would not want to make, and, and I have seen them fight, literally, <laughs> for what they perceive as their uh, position. So the motivation to be seen as an independent thinker means that sometimes you have to eschew the conservative traditional beliefs and so forth. Excellent, thank you, that's very helpful. Anyone have a question? Anybody have a question? Go ahead. So um, I am, I know that the course is about science and the Bible. How difficult is it or when students want to stray from that topic and use more social issues, more issues of like, for instance, how the Bible treats women and the perspective of women and feminism, how do you handle that? 
situation where you want to stay on topic, but the two are trying to veer you off, and you may not be able to go in that direction. How do you handle that? Yeah, so I try to be respectful to the students, and a lot of students have uh, concerns related to social issues, and those, those can be very valid concerns. Uh, that is not the topic of the course, though, and so I respectfully but firmly steer things back to the core topic of the course. Questions, real quick. Professor, if you put the course online in any way, would you videotape? Would you available? No. <clears throat> Can I ask for that? What was your final comment? Could, could you do that? I mean, I, I assume UT has great resources to videotape and, 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 and make available. Yes. For the past two years, all of my classes are on Zoom, and those are automatically recorded and go onto the cloud. They're not widely accessible. All the time, I get people asking, can I come and sit in your class? Or do I record it? And um, I, I, I have two principles in my class that I adhere to quite strongly that I think are key to the freshmen. I mean, they're, these are brand new out of high school students, nearly all of them, to their being able to best take advantage of the environment I try to provide for them. Uh, and, and basically, it comes to an open discussion environment. Uh, I tell them that uh, in high school, maybe you could get ahead by figuring out what the teacher's thoughts were in a particular topic, and then you just mimic that back to the teacher. That's going to get you nowhere in my course. I, what, when you say something, and the students get graded, that's the major part of their grade, and what thoughts they develop on, I, I have a new provocative topic every week. They have to write an essay every week, and we discuss it in class every week amongst themselves, in small groups, and in the, in the entire class together. So what you say has to be what you genuinely think about whatever that topic is. And hot, hot buttons are a bit of the stuff I've talked about, evolution, uh, how everything got started, when it got started, and so forth. And you personally need to back up what your thoughts are. But number two, when somebody puts themselves in kind of an exposed position personally in, in front of their peers, in front of their professor, everybody else has to respect that because that's what that person genuinely thinks about that topic. Now, you don't have to agree, but you have to respect it. And, uh, that has, establishing that culture right from the get-go has opened things up for magnificent discussions. Students at the end of the course say, I so much appreciate being able to hear what people have to say who have different thoughts than I do. Now, if these young students realize that they were being recorded for broadcasting <laughs> to wherever, or if there were more mature people in class, be they advanced, more advanced students, or mom and dad, or whomsoever, that would really suppress the openness of expression. And so I, I have, from the beginning, I've guarded the class that way. So the, the 
one subject that you pointed out was uh, that it kind of struck me as a Chicago economy. And so, um, and, and then kind of connecting that with, you know, the, the freshmen and the, the maturity of the individuals that, that you know, you lecture, um, got me to thinking that, you know, when I first set foot on the University of Texas campus in September of 1984 as a freshman, um, I was, compared to where I am now, a baby Christian. Um, and you perfectly described the process that I've gone through you know, over these many years in that the only limitation to, um, I guess, my growth and my sanctification are the ones that I put on myself. Um, and so I'm curious that <coughs> When you're talking to such kind of what I would say, you know, compared to folks who are, you know, older, uh, immature individuals, how do you kind of convey um, the concept of God's economy and that there is unlimited capital that they can draw on if they will only, you know, be open to that and, and be aware that given in contrast, the campus life, again, back when, when I attended UT, um, you had so many competing interests that were anti-godly, anti-biblical, that um, yeah, it, it was difficult um, to, to kind of stay on that path. And um, I fully admit that you know I, I veered off quite frequently <laughs> at that age. So is there is there a way that you can you can kind of convey God's economy that they can understand and are they interested in, in kind of learning more about that? Well, that's a superb question. And uh, I kind of in, enforce their learning because they have to write an essay on what is your understanding of God's economy and what do you think of it? And that's after we've spent a week and the basis of going through God's economy is reading about it in the Bible. That Greek word oikonomia occurs in a number of places. I, I opened up here to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. 1 Timothy 1, 4 is another good place. Uh, I put my own Bible up on the dock cam. I read this thing cover to cover every year. For decades and I've got all kinds of notes in it concerning God's economy uh, this is a study Bible and and so they get a lot of real thoughtful input on this I must say amongst uh, the students I had this year 51 maxed out uh, a strong majority of whom grew up just strong young Christians who wanted to maintain and grow in their faith when they came to UT and had been warned, oh my goodness, what an environment you're headed for. Uh, a common theme I hear is that the most challenging part of the course is to gain uh, an understanding that translates to experience of God's economy. And um, I, I really try and work on that with the students, and I, I realize it's not simple. But this is the University of Texas. I have full privilege to push these students as hard to get them into uh, an uncomfortable, growing uh, environment. So I, I shall continue to do that in, in my own feeling is this can really help them in their future life, uh, whatever that may be, spiritually and family and professionally, to continue to grow, to have this realization that there is this dimension provided by God himself, and they have access to it. I don't know if that's enough of an answer. Or... Yes. Yes, your question. So, um, okay, I'll be on my two, two unrelated questions. One is, um, 
had there been any sort of, um, uh, I guess, uh, understanding or discussion of how this course is sort of maybe indicted uh, with the rest of the universities up to in terms of the classic purposes of higher education to encourage students uh, and, and to teach students how to pursue truth, beauty, and love, number one. And then number two, has there been any sort of, um, um, is, is there any sort of uh, uh, consideration within the course of how the Bible is uniquely situated to shed light um, science uh, relative to other books like the Quran or something that, to that effect? And if you have any Muslims and people around the state who come into the course. And sure. <clears throat> Okay, I'll try and take them in order to the best of my ability here. Uh, I think a course like this, and specifically this particular course, merges very well with the fundamental um, mission of the university, which is to uh, help students develop to become uh, creative, critical thinkers are on, on their own two feet, not afraid to take tough subjects head on and pull together the resources to figure out for themselves what they think about a difficult situation. And I, I, I try and present the course in that line. I, I've got my own thoughts. I tell the students, absolutely, I don't want you to adopt my own thoughts. I want you to think critically about the issues that I bring to your attention and develop your own perspectives and be able to express that in written form and in verbal form compellingly. And of course, there's a whole spectrum of capability this way. And some students are very comfortable doing that. Other students, it's a real uncomfortable struggle for them, but they all have to face it, and that's part of being at the university. So I think this really fits in, and feedback I get from my colleagues matches that. Uh, I have uh, a number of engineering colleagues who are believers, and I have a number who are not believers. Uh, some of the not believing colleagues uh, are very glad to see this kind of a course in existence. I, I was just talking with my department chair, uh, as I said on Thursday when I told her I was going to resign at the end of next year. And uh, she has never declared her personal faith. But uh, I, I told her that I would like to start an informal course because so many students who can't get into the course come to me and, and wish to engage in this kind of dialogue together. So uh, I, I wanted to start something informal for them. And she just jumped right on board. She said, this is the kind of experience that students need to have engaging in this sort of uh, uh, developing who you are, really, is what it is. And, and so she proposed formalizing it, not for credit, for graduation, but really being on board. And so uh, I, I would say this course absolutely fits in. We, we have a, a banquet at the end of every semester that the dean sponsors for uh, the teachers of these courses. And a lot of them tend to be very much on the liberal social side of the board. And we sit around and uh, talk together, usually around a table with 10 or so during lunch, informally, and people talk about what they're doing. and. Uh, Liberal people are just nearly uniformly enthusiastic about there being a course like this for students at the University of Texas. Okay, so that's question one. Question two, I got all. Do you have any people of other faiths? 
Oh. Yeah, so I, I, I do get students from non-Christian backgrounds, and Muslim is the most typical. Uh, in interestingly, that aspect does not come up. Uh, my own view is that I try to be careful to keep to not use the Bible scientifically and not use the science relating to purpose. Now, I know uh, this is not aligned with Hugh's perspective, and, and we've discussed this personally. And uh, yeah, I have my own view, and I, he has his view, and I respect his, and he respects mine. But, uh, uh, I, I am not personally comfortable with trying to use my Bible as a scientific tool, if I can put it that way, and I, I think that applies for the Koran or anything else without getting my shovel and digging too deep here. And uh, does that address your second question sufficiently? Thank you for your presentation, Professor. Uh, I'm curious because it seems that increasingly the Christian faith is under attack in the media and popular culture. Is there an apologetic component in your course? Because I, I know that a number of Christians that I've met tend to prefer to remain relatively silent in their belief, particularly as they, as they're confronted with, with popular culture. Is there an apologetic component where you're helping students in how to express Sure. Uh, uh, I, I would say I try and address that directly and, and equip the, the students, and uh, it tends to be along these two lines right here. Students tend to enjoy some to relish engage, engaging in disputed debates in this arena. And a typical attack that Christians receive is, well, you cannot prove your faith. Therefore, it's invalid, which is baloney. <laughs> uh, and and uh, it, it's just in a different realm. And crossing these over just doesn't work. I, I had a very enjoyable discussion some years ago with uh, Dennis's and my colleague, John Goodenough, UT's most recent Nobel Prize winner for developing the, the batteries that uh, power, if I can do this. <laughs> Thank you, John. Uh, and John is a genuine believer. He's written a, a book on his faith, kind of an apologetics book. And uh, I was talking with him about this very issue, you know, people wanting to attack a Christian because of such a supposedly weak stance because we can't offer material proof of our faith. And if you know John, he has the most unique laugh at the University of Texas. It's kind of a loud, I can't even imitate it, Dennis knows. <laughs> and so he broke into his overwhelming laugh and he says, those silly people, they're not using the right transducer. 
And so in this realm, there are wonderful, powerful transducers for measuring things, but there's no transducer that can measure spiritual reality. So if you try and use a transducer from the scientific domain to pick up the reality in the spiritual realm, the needle is just going to stay on the zero peg. And you can either come to the conclusion, number one, there is nothing there, which makes an assumption that your transducer is valid for what you're trying to measure. Or, number two, I'm using the wrong transducer. And very few people do that. And to me, that is a simple perspective on this contentious issue that gets brought up without merit. And I share this with students in various ways and try and equip them to be not stumbled in their faith when they encounter some of these invalid arguments that hold no water. Is that enough of an answer? So I'd like to uh, end with this. Other people have questions, and hopefully you will have a minute afterwards that uh, you'd be happy to talk to people. So you mentioned before that one of the hot button topics with evolution that comes up in your class. I'd like to know what the three or four hot button issues are that come up semester after semester after semester that are consistent. And then are there any memorable exchanges with students that, that you can remember where our student, the light came on? And you enjoyed that teaching moment, that dialogue, if you will, if you will do those two, close with those two. Okay. Um, to answer your first question, I, I, I think a lot of uh, my experience in that domain hinges around evolution. And Science marches forward. That is the nature of science. Good people continue to do uh, quality science and get it published. And uh, I came to the realization yeah, in recent years that the whole concept of evolution is evolving. Uh, <clears throat> it historically has been based on the assumption that mutations which drive changes in species have to occur non-randomly. They're just accidents and you have to await for the occurrence of a favorable accident. And this is what I share with students. And science has found in, in recent years that uh, an important component of evolution occurs via what is now called non-random mutation. And, and I do this live in class, and I'm not going to do it now, but you just get on Google Scholar and type in non-random mutation. I was intending to do that this morning to get a, a current count on the number of publications that have that as a key word, but I'm sure it's in the millions. <clears throat> and so people are realizing that many of the mutations that occur are actually not random. They are driven by external forces including environmental forces. So what does that do? Number one, that really compresses the timeline for which evolutionary changes can occur. You're just not waiting for an accident to happen, and who knows when that's going to be. But if there is some organized external driving force behind that, then the necessary mutations to end up with a, a particular outcome can happen orders of magnitude 
more rapidly. And, and so evolutionary processes in God's hands can be a useful tool in advancing uh, things toward the point where we have Genesis 126 and everything's ready to introduce human beings in his image after his likeness into the creation. In particular, I like to use that non-scientifically with Romans chapter one that says nobody is without excuse for not believing in God because the entirety of creation testifies of him, okay? And the entirety of creation is the environment we're in. And, uh, and, and so if that has uh, an expression, a testimony of God, that very environment could drive non-random processes toward actually expressing God. And are there other hot topic, hot button topic issues that come up? Uh, that is the most consistent one. Uh, the age of the universe is another one that many Christians come into the course being told you have to believe in the young earth model. And uh, I like to use uh, Genesis 1-2, uh, which has two prime components. That, that, of course, is the verse that's used for the so-called gap theory that uh, and allows for an undefined period of time between in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and then everything had to be recovered in the subsequent days. And, uh, and that verse says that uh, at, at that point the creation was uh, various translations but waste and empty or whatever. And that particular word occurs in Isaiah 45, 18, which says explicitly, God did not create the universe to be waste. And it uses that same word, and that same word is used only a few times in the entire Old Testament Hebrew. And, and so that is a, a compelling evidence right within the Bible that Genesis 1, 2, does not describe the way things were in God's initial intention in his foreordained creation in Genesis 1.1. And so this, with a lot of people, they just have an aha epiphany. The Bible really doesn't support the young earth model. And uh, uh, another thing of interest is the flood story. That's, that's a favorite one. And uh, Genesis 1-2 indicates that God had used flooding water as a judgment on the corrupted creation after Lucifer uh, rebelled and and caused all the problems that are described in the Old Testament. And uh, I, I have uh, been a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science for more than half a century, and so you get a, a weekly issue of the Journal of Science, which I have read virtually every week for over half a century. And that is uh, uh, the most reputable that in the journal Nature for quality science publications. And about 15 or so years ago, uh, the scientists at one of the major petroleum companies 
published there some of their proprietary uh, experimental uh, data they'd gotten from doing core drillings all over the world and hunting for petroleum resources. And when you do core drilling, you get a geological history of that particular area. And so uh, they took these core drillings and did a timeline comparison uh, from all over the world. And they determined that that scientific data, no biblical thought whatsoever, showed that there had been, I believe the number is 117 episodes of global flooding over the epochs. Which supports what the Bible says, that God uses global flooding as a judgmental tool uh, uh, on his corrupted creation. The Bible for sure says that his creation was corrupted when Satan rebelled to try and overthrow God's position. That again is an aha moment. Science does not say the same thing the Bible does, but absolutely can be viewed in a harmonious way with what we see in the Bible. Okay, Professor Dillon, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.